Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Catherine Bergeron. I'm the Dean of the College, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this afternoon's uh, talk by Leslie Chang. Leslie Chang, as I think all of you know, is a wonderful writer, uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about some things that you may not know. She started her career very soon after graduating from Harvard College, first uh, as a journalist working uh, for the Miami Herald, and then for an expatriate newspaper in Prague. And in 1993, she joined the Wall Street Journal, working initially in Hong Kong and Taiwan, and then um, moving on to uh, the People's Republic of China. So it was in the course of this uh, decade-long assignment that she brought out the series of award-winning articles that eventually turned into her first published book in 2008. And this was a book called Factory Girls. It's really a remarkable story about rural migration in modern China, told from the point of view of the young women who form uh, the core of China's industrial workforce. So the book has received much critical acclaim in the year following its publication. Uh, it was cited, I think, in no less than seven of, um, as the, one of the best books uh, of the year by no less than seven prominent newspapers or weeklies. And this includes the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, the Christian Science Monitor, San Francisco Chronicle, the Seattle Times, um, Time Magazine, and Business Week. Uh, in 2009, Factory Girls also won the Penn USA Literary Award for Research Nonfiction. And in 2011, uh, I would say it became something of a bestseller at Brown. <laughs> That's right, we have, a <laughs> we have a program each year that we call First Readings, where incoming first year transfer and resumed undergraduate students read a book in common and discuss it with fellow students in small seminars moderated by a faculty member or a senior staff member. Uh, last year, Professor Chang Yi Tan, who is directing Brown's initiative, The Year of China, approached me to see if we could think about um, finding a book that would give students the opportunity to think seriously about China. And so after soliciting a number of recommendations from faculty experts, we chose Factory Girls. And this means if you count up all the advisors and students and faculty members, uh, who read this book, there are probably a couple of thousand people on the Brown campus who have read and talked about this book this year. Um, and I know uh, quite a few of you are here today. And so I know you will also agree with me that uh, there are many, many things to admire about this book. There uh, is first the story of the two protagonists, Min and Chun Ming, and uh, Leslie Chang's very sensitive portrayal of their struggles and their dreams and, um, and their hopes as they, they seek to make it in an unstable and uh, competitive marketplace. Uh, there's the account of other historical migrations of families displaced from the mainland to Taiwan and from Taiwan to the United States, which uh, turns out to be the story of Chang's own family. And there is, lurking behind all this, I think, a story about the author herself. You may agree with me or not, but I would say a story about Leslie Chang herself and her own transformation um, from a journalist into a novelist. What I personally loved about the book, in a way, was this hybridity, the way the factual domain of the journalist is opened up by the novelist's imagination, or you could say the way narrative desire is caught or suspended by the fact that the book's characters are real people. So we're very fortunate to have Leslie Chang here today to tell us in her own words about how she came to write Factory Girls in the way that she did and what has happened to her friends Min and Chun Ming in the intervening years. And for now, um, I think I'm sure you will all want to join me in thanking Leslie Chang for writing this wonderful book and for being with us today. Won't you welcome Leslie Chang?
Thank you for that very kind and sympathetic introduction. Uh, it's, a, it's a great, great honor to visit Brown University and to know that all of you have read and, in fact, were forced to read my book. <laughs> uh, seriously, I think a writer can ask for no more than for people to read her book and to discuss it and to engage with it, particularly since so many of you are just a few years older than the young women I write about, and I think you can connect with these characters in a different way. So thank you for this honor. Factory Girls is my first book. It took three years to research and a year and a half to write. I certainly hope the next one goes a little bit faster. Today, I want to talk a little bit about how I reported and wrote this book, some of the mistakes I made and the lessons I learned. I think these lessons apply to nonfiction writing, but I hope that they may also help you as you embark on academic, artistic, or creative projects of your own. Most journalists dream of writing a book, and from the time I arrived in China in 1998 as a reporter for the Wall Street Journal, I had this idea in the back of my mind. But I wanted to find a worthy subject, and I also wanted something that was a good lens through which to see China today. I wrote a bunch of pieces about Chinese youth, and then I did a series about technology and the internet. None of these subjects felt broad enough. They seemed like only narrow slices of the immense change I saw all around me. Around 2004, I suddenly started wondering about the young people who were leaving their farming villages to work in factories of the coast. I thought the journeys to the city might be interesting to write about. By this time, migration in China had been going on for about two decades. The New York Times and the Washington Post had done long series about migrant workers, focusing mostly on the suffering and the abuses of factory life. My editors still remembered two articles that a colleague of mine had written eight years before. In all of their eyes, migration was a non-starter, done to death, definitely not news. Still, on a weekend when not much else was going on, I took a plane down to the South China factory city of Dongguan. I spent two days walking around the factory districts, talking to young women on the street, and hearing their stories. After two days, I realized that I'd finally found my book subject. So lesson number one is even if something has been done before, you can still do it in your own way. After I returned home to Beijing, I decided to propose a series of stories to my editor at the Wall Street Journal. My idea was that each reporter in the China Bureau could do one story. The reason was I was already working on so many other stories, and I thought this would be a good way to get these stories out. I spoke to my boyfriend at the time, who is also a writer, and he said this was a terrible idea. Which brings me to lesson number two. Well, he's not my husband, so I have no one to blame. Lesson number two, as he said, writing is not a group activity. So that first weekend in Dongguan, I met two 16-year-old girls who were just out from their farming village in Henan province. They were working in an electronics factory and earning $40 a month. By the time we sat down in a noodle shop and had Cokes, I decided that I would write about them. I decided I would document their first year in the city and track their fortunes wherever they went. We made plans to meet two weeks later in the same public square where we'd first met. And I'll read a little bit from that chapter. I flew down from Beijing two weeks later to wait for them on the square. We had agreed to meet at 10 o'clock, but there were many reasons they might not come. Perhaps they had found better jobs with overtime and couldn't get away. Possibly they had decided they didn't trust me. Or they simply forgot or had something interesting, more interesting to do. Maybe they had already joined the ranks of the disappeared. Why would they come? My only hope came from something Yongxia had said, we are so lonely. I waited until almost noon. By then I knew they were not coming. But I also knew that once I left the square, they would be lost to me forever. They were 16 years old from Henan province. That was all I knew about them and their names. In their frilly tops and jeans and ponytails, they looked just like the millions of other young women who had come to Dongguan from somewhere else. I couldn't bring myself to meet anyone else that day. I wandered under the hot sun for hours, looking at people and talking myself out of approaching them for the pettiest of reasons. If they were in a group, they might be hard to talk to. If they were eating or drinking, they were too well off. The sight of so many girls I would never know was paralyzing. 
it seemed inconceivable that any single story mattered at all. For months afterward, whenever I came to the city, I looked closely into the faces of the young girls on the streets, hoping to find Yongxia and Da Li again. Many of the girls looked back at me, wary or curious or challenging. There are millions of young women, and each one has a story worth telling. I had to look into their faces to begin. So lesson number three is always get the phone number and address of anyone you might want to write about. More important, I think, is lesson number four, failure can teach you something important. Because after I lost touch with these two girls, Yongxia and Da Li, I started to see that losing touch with people was the central fact of factory life. Almost everyone I got to know in the city had lost contact with someone they'd been close to. Later, when Min had her cell phone stolen and had no way to find her two best friends or her boyfriend who'd already gone home, I understood a little bit what that felt like. That first weekend that I met Min, I wasn't sure that I would end up writing about her at all. She was intelligent, dynamic, interesting, and curious, all good things, of course. But she had just talked her way off the assembly line into a job as a clerk, and I figured that now her life would be stable and nothing more would happen to her. It didn't turn out that way. Over the next two years, I saw Min every month, and every time I saw her, she had some major change in her life, whether it was a new hairstyle, a new boyfriend, a new job prospect, or an entirely new life plan. So my expectations about her had been completely wrong. So lesson number five is to have faith. Even if you don't know how your story will end, as long as your subjects are interesting and you spend time with them, you'll end up with something good. My next step was to find a factory to write about, and I convinced the shoe factory Yu Yuan to give me access to their, the workers' dormitories. My plan was to find a group of girls and follow them over a year. Perhaps some of them would be promoted and others would stay behind. Maybe some would find boyfriends while others remained single. I would chart their ups and downs and explore the dynamics and the relationships between them. So I tried and tried and I never found this group of people. I did meet a few young women in the factory, but what struck me was how alone each one was. They might work together by day and sleep in adjoining bunks at night, but they knew almost nothing about each other. The workers had few friends and they did not trust each other. They did not trust me either. One would make a date to meet me and not show up, or another might tell her roommates to lie and say she had already left the factory. Going back through my notes, I made 12 visits to Yu Yuan and I saw girls on only seven of them, missing them on the other five visits. So I spent as much time searching for them as I did talking to them. I agonized over this failure, and only while writing this book did I realize my characters were not the girls who worked at Yu Yuan. My character was Yu Yuan. The factory was the constant, and the girls moved in and out of its shadow. Once I realized that, I was able to write the chapter in the book called Factory Girls. It turned out to be much darker than I originally envisioned, really a story of alienation and loneliness and perva the pervasive sense that one could disappear and never be seen again. But this is what felt true to what I had seen and experienced. Getting to know the factory girls of Yu Yuan was not easy. Girls would make dates to meet me and not show up. If I found them later, they gave no explanation or apology. No one was willing to accept the mobile phone I offered so we could stay in touch, perhaps not wanting the responsibility. They might be friendly to me one day and cold the next, and if I struck up a conversation with one girl in a dorm, the others in the room would shun me. One girl instructed her roommates to lie and tell me she had already left the factory because her friends had told her I was not to be trusted. The company granted me free access to its dormitories, but winning the trust of those who lived there was the hard part. In the shadow of the giant shoe factory, they flitted insubstantial as moths and more elusive than anyone I met in the city. The girls were equally wary with one another and often spoke roughly among themselves. They frequently knew nothing about the people with whom they lived and worked. As I got to know them better, they often asked me for news of one another. Most girls seemed to have one or two true friends who lived far away perhaps in another factory, preferring to confide in them rather than in the many close by. Maybe this was their defense against living in a colony of strangers. They took it for granted that someone who slept in an adjoining bunk one night 
would disappear the next. It took willpower for any migrant worker to change her situation, but inside a factory as large as Yuyuan, the pressure to conform felt especially intense. The girls all claimed in front of one another that they didn't approve of finding a boyfriend in the city, although many of them already had. They disparaged further education as useless, even as some quietly took classes in an effort to improve themselves. Yuyuan was a good place to work. Everyone who worked there said that. But if you wanted something different, it took all your strength to break free. So lesson number six is be willing to abandon your original plan and follow wherever your story takes you. When I told friends that I was writing a book about Dongguan, invariably they would ask me, especially if they were men, are you going to write about the prostitutes? The sex industry in the city was huge, but just the fact that everyone talked about it made me not want to write about it. The subject made me uncomfortable. I thought it would be depressing to meet young girls who were selling their bodies for money. Finally, I decided that I had to learn about the sex trade. An American friend took me to some karaoke clubs, and what I saw there was not at all what I had expected. The young women were disarmingly frank about what they did for a living. I met many of them on two successive nights at different clubs. When I said I was writing a book about Dongguan and asked about their work, not a single one played coy or denied that she had sex with customers. Occasionally, I sensed small deceptions. They might overstate their earnings or claim they had been tricked into this line of work. Several told me rather unconvincingly that they planned to quit their jobs the following day. But they were not cynical and hard as I expected them to be. They were girlish and they giggled like teenagers. And sometimes, as we were talking, they started to cry. I was torn about what to think of them. It would certainly be awful to have sex with the type of Chinese man who frequented karaoke lounges. In that respect, they had my sympathy. Yet much of their workday was spent in leisurely fashion, sipping cocktails, eating peanuts, watching music videos. And for that, they made more money in a month than someone like Min earned in a whole year. The initial decision to enter this world was surprisingly casual. Most of the young women I talked to had started working at a karaoke club because a friend or cousin was doing it the same way a migrant would go to a certain city or factory because she knew someone there. After they arrived, they came up with reasons to stay. It was easy work, it paid well, and you could learn about the world. The karaoke girls came from better circumstances than the factory girls I had met. That too was a surprise. Often they had grown up in a small city or town rather than on the farm. A fair number were only children or the youngest in their families, which meant they had fewer financial burdens. Quite a few had attended high school, which placed them in the rural elite. Alin, with two years of high school, was the most educated young person in her village. At home, they are expecting me to come out and make a success of myself, she said. If they knew I was working in a place like this, they would never forgive me. Compared to the factory girls, they were freer to do what they wanted. Maybe they were too free, and lacking a clear purpose had made them lose their bearings once they came to the city. No one had forced them into prostitution. In fact, they had chosen this line of work because they expected more out of life. Most of the girls wanted to return home eventually to set up a clothing shop or a hair salon. Almost everybody knew someone who had done this. A motivated young woman could save enough money in a year or two to pull it off, but it was easy to lose your way. So lesson number seven is confront the things that you would rather avoid. It will make your work stronger. I decided early on in my research that I wanted to include my family story in the book. I thought the tale of my grandfather leaving his own farming village a hundred years ago would be a good counterpoint to the story of the young girls leaving their villages. I wanted my book to have a sense of history because history is so important in China, if people, even if people don't talk about it very much. I thought it would also allow me to write in a different voice, to be not just an observer, but a participant, a Chinese American and a daughter with emotional ties to China. Some readers have told me this was the best part of the book. Others have said they wish I left it out entirely, that the story of educated landowners in North China was too far removed from the stories of young women in factories. But this was the story I wanted to tell. So lesson number eight is to follow your instincts. Sometimes the more unexpected route is the best one for you. 
One challenge of writing about family history was how little documentation remained. Through the chaotic years of the Japanese invasion, the civil war between the nationalists and the communists, the flight to Taiwan and the immigration to America, my family had moved countless times and left behind everything they owned. But one day, about a year into my research, my boyfriend at the time said, you should ask your father if he has anything that belonged to his father. I'm sure he doesn't, I said. Just ask. So I called up my father, and he said yes. He had two of my grandfather's diaries, one from his time in America, another while he lived in Chongqing during the war. They totaled about 1,000 pages. By the way, my father knew I was writing a book about family history, so it was especially surprising that this was what he told me. And then he said, you know, it's not very interesting. He just writes things like, today the Japanese army is closing in around the city. And I said, you know what, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> so lesson number nine is don't take anything for granted. As my first editor at the Wall Street Journal used to say, there are no dumb questions. So after two years of research with most of my reporting done, I sat down in my Beijing apartment to start writing my book. I remember the panic I felt that first morning, thinking I am no longer earning a salary just sitting here at my desk. I spent most of the morning flipping through my favorite books, reading their openings, searching for a key to begin my own story. And one of my favorite short stories, Winter Dreams by F. Scott Fitzgerald, I found something. This is how the story opens. Some of the caddies were poor as sin and lived in one-room houses with a neurasthenic cow in the yard. But Dexter Green's father owned the second best grocery store in Black Bear. The best one was The Hub, patronized by the wealthy people from Sherry Island, and Dexter caddied only for pocket money. So what struck me about that opening was the way Fitzgerald immediately throws you straight into a world with its intricate codes of status and behavior. One paragraph in, and you already understand in your bones what it means that your father owns the second best grocery store in town. I realized that I could open my book the same way. After two years, I felt that I knew the factory world from the inside. The girls had given me an operating manual, and this world was as intricate a system of etiquette and hierarchy as anything in a Fitzgerald story. This is what I ended up with. When you met a girl from another factory, you quickly took her measure. What year are you, you asked each other, as if speaking not of human beings, but of the makes of cars? How much a month, including room and board? How much for overtime? Then you might ask what province she was from. You never asked her name. To have a true friend inside the factory was not easy. Girls slept 12 to a room, and in the tight confines of the dorm, it was better to keep your secrets. Some girls joined the factory with borrowed ID cards and never told anyone their real names. Some spoke only to those from their home provinces, but that had risks. Gossip traveled quickly from factory to village, and when you went home, every auntie and granny would know how much you made and how much you saved and whether you went out with boys. When you did make a friend, you did everything for her. If a friend quit her job and had nowhere to stay, you shared your bunk, despite the risk of a 10 yuan fine, about $1.25, if you got caught. If she worked far away, you'd get up early on a rare day off and ride hours on the bus, and at the other end, your friend would take leave from work this time the fine 100 yuan, to spend the day with you. You might stay at a factory you didn't like or quit when you did because a friend asked you to. Friends wrote letters every week, although the girls who had been out longer considered that childish. They sent messages by mobile phone instead. Friends fell out often because life was changing so fast. The easiest thing in the world was to lose touch with someone. So lesson number 10 is that inspiration can come from anywhere. So read everything, watch everything, listen to everything, because you never know when you might find a key that you can use in your own work, in your own life. So if there's one truth about China, it's that things change very quickly. And I want to talk a little bit about the changes that have happened since the book came out three years ago, both in the Chinese economy and in the lives of the young women who I write about. In late 2008, China's economy slowed as part of a global downturn. The export industries in places like Dongguan were especially hard hit. Many factories cut production or even shut down altogether and laid off workers. 
Foreign newspapers predicted massive social unrest and declared that this was the end of Chinese manufacturing. Over 2009, China's economy gradually recovered. By the autumn, factories were ramping up orders so fast that they were short of workers, and many factories started increasing wages. Again, newspapers predicted the end of Chinese manufacturing, that now workers were too expensive and that factories would move to other places. So what we can conclude, other than that newspapers love to make doomsday predictions that are usually wrong, is that Chinese workers and the economy that they power are quite flexible and resilient. During the slowdown, many workers did indeed go home and they stayed there after the new year doing odd jobs and waiting and looking for opportunities. And when the economy picked up the next year, many of them went back out to the cities and found work again. Increasingly, there's a third choice between staying close to home and traveling far away to a city like Dongguan, and that's finding work in a city closer to their home villages. Much of the economic growth in China is now taking place in the interior. Cities like Beijing and Shanghai are already very developed, and now it feels like the moment for the second and third tier cities. I was in Chongqing in China's interior in March, and it felt like one giant construction site, the way Beijing and Shanghai felt in the 1990s. So a lot of migrants are now finding work in these boom towns closer to home. When I was in Dongguan, one factory manager estimated that the city's population had dropped from 13 million to 10 million. If that still sounds like a huge number, it is, and a reminder of the scale of Chinese cities that we're talking about. I recently told Chunming that the small town that I live in in southern, southwestern Colorado has a population of 700. There was a pause, and she said, don't you mean 7 million? But I think the general trends of migration and urbanization, wherever people are going, they've been going on for three decades and they will continue for decades to come. There's still 600 million people who are officially registered as rural Chinese residents, and for them the cities are places of prosperity and opportunity, and I believe that these journeys to the city will continue. The two women I wrote about have also gone through many changes since the end of the book. Min stayed on at her purchasing job at the metal parts factory for another two years, earning enough money that she was able to help her parents buy an apartment in the town near their village. She married a fellow migrant in 2009, bought a second-hand Buick, had two daughters, and now lives in her husband's family's home in Hunan province, where he runs a business delivering construction materials. If that's not enough to pack into three years, she also recently wrote me an email about her latest business plan. I will open a restaurant in partnership with a reliable friend. She will be in charge of store issues and I will handle the investment. Less than 100,000 yuan, which is about $15,000, should be enough and we will share the risk and profits together. When the county does its big development plan, we will find a way to buy a larger truck to do deliveries. This way, both Liu Yong, her husband, and I will have our own businesses and we won't have as many difficulties as before. Please have confidence in me. I believe that we will succeed. Twin Ming, meanwhile, has switched careers six times since the end of the book. She has sold, in turn, life insurance, Snoopy diapers, air fresheners, French wine and perfume, and synthetic leather for shoes. Her current job, as of last month, is signing up franchisees in a chain of traditional style tea houses. She continues to go out on blind dates and she's branched out to include Taiwanese, Brazilian, and African men. She's 36-year-old and still unmarried, which is very unusual for someone of her background in China. In her village, she recently told me, there's someone a year older than her who is already a grandmother. She's still full of optimism. She recently wrote something on a social networking website, and she sent it to me. When well-meaning friends learn I'm not married, some will say jokingly, don't have such high demands. If everyone were like you, our society would be in trouble. But in my heart, I think, why must I lower my standards? Just because of my age? But I'm more mature now. I know how to dress up and be feminine, and I know more and more about the ways of the world. So I should raise my standards for finding a boyfriend. Maybe a lot of friends think my high demands are for an apartment, a car, and so on. In terms of material wealth, I believe that in this society with many opportunities, as long as a person has dreams and drive and is willing to work hard, then what should come will come. I've always believed that God looks out for those who are diligent, brave, and enterprising. I will work hard to seek my happiness. 
I believe I will surely have my own happiness because being a good woman will bring happiness and I am a good woman. So I wanted to show some um, pictures from my time in Dongguan and other places in China so you can see some of the things that, that I've been writing about. Um, this is the cover of my book. Um, I don't know who the young woman is. I'm constantly asked who she is and I think the photographer just liked the picture and took it and, and that's that. And sometimes I'm asked if that woman is me and I say no, she's a 20-year-old migrant worker um, and I'm a 42-year-old writer, but whatever. Um, the ads behind her, as you probably guessed, are all help wanted advertisements. Um, so she's obviously visiting some kind of job market and looking for work. And since this was such a central um, motif of, of my book and also a factory life, I thought it was very appropriate. Um, this is kind of a not ex I, w I guess I wouldn't say typical, but a picture that's recognizable of young women getting off work or maybe at some sort of company gathering. Um, I considered using this for the cover of my book, but ended up not doing it. But I really liked the energy and the optimism conveyed by these young women. And I felt like it was such a counterpoint to so many of the stories you read about the migrant workers and the factory girls who are you know, oppressed and suffering and victims and faceless and all these things. And you can see that they're not, they're young and they're full of energy and their lives may be very difficult, but they have a lot of hope for their own futures. And that's kind of one of the first things you notice when you're in a place like Dongguan is just the youth and the energy of the place. Um, kind of like when you're on, it, kind of like when you're on a college campus, you know, you feel the youth seriously and the energy, um, not comparing you guys to factory workers or anything like that, but. Um, yeah, I don't know if you've seen the photographs of Edward Bertinsky, he's a very well-known photographer, but he does these beautiful kind of industrial shots of places like Dongguan, often with streams of thousands of workers, you know, working in rows and an assembly line, and they're formally very beautiful photos, but at the same time I feel like they convey a message that these workers are just kind of cogs in a machine, and I don't agree with that, so I, I like the pictures that show the individuals. Um, so this is a picture that a photographer friend of mine took inside a factory. Um, as you can tell, this is, this is, or maybe you can't tell, but this is a much better factory than most. Um, it's clean, it's orderly. The young women are sitting down, um, which is definitely something you want to do rather than stand for 11 hours working at one spot on an assembly line doing the same thing hundreds of times every day. Um, there, there's been some effort to make the place a little pretty with those fake vines, so um, this is definitely um, a nice factory. Um, I did not go into many factories in China because factory bosses are very nervous about having an outsider visit, and it's not just because they're nervous that you're a foreigner or that you're a writer. Most of all, they're nervous that you're gonna steal their commercial secrets and set up a rival factory across the street and steal other workers and customers, um, which tells you kind of what most people in China are thinking about, which is just you know thinking about their business and, and how to advance it and how to protect it. Um, so the shoe factory that I visited, Yu Yuan, pictures are coming up next, um, was, unusual in that they, they were quite confident in the changes they made in worker situations in recent years, and they were willing to have me just wander around and talk to people. So this is the uh, worker dorms at Yuren, um, where I spent a lot of my time. Um, each of these buildings houses 2,000 workers, um, and it, it really does feel like its own city. Um, when I first got there, it felt very dreary to me, very oppressive, very hot, very faceless, and then gradually as you get to know people, it sort of becomes something different. Um, this young woman is Jia Ji Mei. She's one of the young women I write about in the chapter Factory Girls, working at the Yuan Shoe Factory. Um, this is her in her dorm room. Um, it probably was a room of about 200 square feet and 10 girls um, were sharing one room. So don't complain about the accommodations you have here. Um, you know, she's, she's, she's sweeping and there's laundry hanging outside and this was basically how these young women spent so much of their time when they weren't working, was cleaning their room, cleaning their clothes, cleaning themselves, you know, a lot of hard work 
and spending a lot of time waiting online with buckets, getting water, you know. So it's sort of like the hidden side of factory life. It's not just sitting at an assembly line for 12 hours a day. It's also all the things you have to do outside of work just to make yourself presentable, just to have kind of a decent, dignified life. Um, the young men's dorms were not nearly as clean, and the young men did not care so much about cleaning the floor and cleaning their clothes. This is another very typical scene in a factory town. Um, these are young, a young women studying computers um, in one of the many, many commercial schools um, that, that would spring up in these factory towns. And um, one survey in, in Shenzhen, which is near Dongguan, showed that almost one third of workers had enrolled in such commercial classes, um, which means paying their own money to learn new skills, and that women um, enrolled in higher numbers than men because they generally felt that their education was poorer and they really needed an edge. Um, this particular school was interesting. It was on the main street in the Yuan shoe factory town, and there was a big sign out front um, that said Microsoft Werb, W-O-R-B. And I remember thinking, you know, I wonder how much they can teach you if they can't even spell Word correctly. Um, but, you know, I went back the next year and they had corrected it, and now it said Microsoft Word. So. Um, I think that just, just because a lot of the education is faulty or flawed or questionable, um, you know, we shouldn't undercount the factor of, of motivation and energy from people who really want to learn. This is another very typical scene in a factory city, shoe sh young women shoe shopping. Um, you know, you'll notice that these two young women who are clearly factory workers and migrants, but they also look like normal young city people. You know, if you saw them in Beijing, you might think they were college kids. Um, very stylish, very confident, you know, nice, nice haircuts. Um, that was one of the things that was very interesting about being in these factory towns was, you know, I, I felt like the, the view among intellectuals was still that migrants, oh, they're very poor, they're very crude, they're very backward, you know, they're never gonna be, become part of the city, they're just always second class citizens, and you would come to these places where young women were just adapting so quickly to urban life and realize that this is not true. You know, your, your view of these young people is totally wrong. You know, that, that probably was true in the early 80s when, when first people first started coming out to the city. Um, in that case, it was often older people um, married couples who would work for a few months and then go back to the farm. They were clearly farmers. But this newer generation of migrants, they're young people, they're coming out from middle school and then starting to work in the factories and they aspire to live in the city and to be like city people. Um, so that's a real shift and you can see it in the physical aspect of these young people. Uh, this is Min. Um, she is at the talent markets looking for a new job. Um, this is probably a few months after I first met her, so she would be 18 years old. Um, the talent market was one of my favorite places to visit because I felt like the, the help wanted ads said so much about what people were looking for. Um, I'll read you some of my favorites, some of which are in the book. Um, one help wanted ad said, secretaries, 155 centimeters or taller, good features. Accountants, no one over age 35. And my all-time favorite, security guards, male, 1.7 meters or above, can play basketball a plus. <laughs> um, I have no idea what that means, except that security guards are probably underemployed in China and play a lot of basketball. Um, but, you know, all jokes aside, the talent market was actually a very egalitarian place, and so many people I knew had gone there, paid the five yuan entrance fee, which is under a dollar, you know, not, not too expensive, and sat down for an interview on the spot and landed a better job. And a better job meaning no longer working on the factory floor, but able to work as a secretary or a sales assistant um, to work in an office and move up. Um, so it was very, very different from the traditional China where you have to have a college degree and you have to have connections and you have to have all these things. Um, you have to be from the right province, you have to have a residency permit. All these things had totally disappeared in a place like Dongguan because everything was so free and open and so pragmatic. Um, so it was actually a very positive place even though it was very tough to be there because it was so cramped and so competitive and, and there was so much pressure. Um, this is another very classic scene of, of um, migrants going home for the new year. Um, 
in the six weeks around the Lunar New Year holiday, 200 million people travel by train. And um, I went home with Min about a year after I first met her. Um, and it definitely felt like all those people were on the train with us. It was just, you know, you, you couldn't decide whether to sit down on the floor and have people step on your head or to stand up, you know, for 14 hours and be exhausted or, you know, there was, there was no good solution. Um, but it, it often seemed to me like this sort of um, rite of passage, you know, for these young people, their path back home is to, is to kind of run this gauntlet of, you know, getting the ticket and getting on the train and then you're home and it's like relief. And um, so it was kind of an interesting passage and I'm glad I got to experience it. Um, so this is Min's village home. Um, this actually came from a later trip I took um, about a couple years after I first went back. I went back again. Um, so, you know, I, as I write about in the book, one thing that amazed me was how, you know, I thought Min and I would go back to her home and she would immediately become a traditional Chinese daughter again. Um, and I was preparing to also act like a traditional Chinese daughter, which I'm not. And um, to be well behaved and instead immediately she went home and she started criticizing everything about her family home and how dirty it was and how they needed a laundry machine and they needed a water heater and you know for two weeks she was just criticizing everything and everybody and I found this to be wonderful in some way but also very poignant because this was her home and this was her family and yet she had changed so much that her relation to it was completely different. Uh, this is Min and her and her family, who are just very wonderful people. Um, she's the one in the front left wearing the pink, um, and that's her older sister in the far right in the purple, and then two younger sisters, and then a younger brother and her parents in the back. And, um, and at the time this picture was taken, Min and her older sister were working in Dongguan, and the three younger siblings were all in school. And now the two younger sisters are both working um, in office jobs in the city. And um, I think both of them got jobs through Min's help, you know, introducing them to her friends and getting them jobs. And the youngest brother is just starting college. So a lot of change has happened. Um, and people often see this picture and ask me about China's one child policy, which clearly is not in effect in this particular village. Um, and, you know, I say that it's, it's just really, really varied. And definitely in the cities, it's implemented very closely, very strictly. And now in big cities, you'll just meet people all the time who say, we only want to have one child because it's so much work, it's so much expense, I can't imagine having two. Um, but in the villages, it's been implemented on a huge range of, of, of wide variations. Um, in some places, it was you could have a second child if the first is a boy. In some cases, it's you can have two children no matter what. And in a place like Min's Village, you could have more children if you're willing to pay the fine. Um, and I sat down with her father and, and talked with him one day, and I said, you know, are you the person who has the most children in your village? And he said, no, actually, our next-door neighbor has six children. And another guy, you know, two rows over, has seven, and he used to be the party secretary for the village. <laughs> So he didn't seem that surprised by any of that. Um, this is just a picture of their kitchen. I mean, their house had no, no running water, no electricity, um, you know, no indoor plumbing, no heating, just very basic. Um, and Min's mother basically spent all her time washing food, preparing food, cooking food, and the younger children would kind of keep the fire going. So just very, very traditional the way life in China used to be for the vast majority of people in the countryside. Um, this was really interesting. This was an altar that was kind of in the main room in Min's house. Um, the, the characters in the middle say um, heaven, earth, uh, nation, family, and teachers. And that's kind of the hierarchy of, of the universe, which I thought was real nice. Um, and there, I, I just like the mix of old and new. You know, there are pictures of, of Min's grandmother who had passed away a couple of years before, um, and then very traditional New Year's kind of posters. Um, but then you also have the awards that the kids have won in school, and there's like a Sprite or a 7-Up, you know, as a kind of an altar offering. 
So, you know, kind of, it just, it speaks very much to kind of how rural life is. People are very flexible, they're very adaptable, they very informal, they take things in, and use them in different ways, and, you know, they get along pretty well. Um, they, uh, this is a, a wedding that I was lucky enough to see when I was in Min's village. Um, this is when they had prepared, this is the bride's house, and they had prepared all the dowry, and they were planning on bringing the dowry to the groom's house. Um, so this is right before the big procession. Um, very traditional, you know, a lot of people are wearing red, which is the color for weddings. And, um, you know, before I went, it was the, the wedding of Min's cousin, and she had told me that she and her sister were going to play a big part in the wedding, um, escorting the bride to the new village. And I said, oh, that's really interesting. That's very traditional. How you know, how do you learn about these traditions? And she said, oh, I don't know. We'll just kind of make it up as we go along. We'll see. <laughs> um, so this is Min's cousin, the young man, and his bride. Um, they were both migrants. She was working in a garment factory a few hours from the village, and he was working in construction in Xinjiang, which is all the way across the country in the far northwest near Tibet. And um, the day before the wedding, I was talking to him and I said, you know, so where are you guys gonna live when you get married? Are you gonna go to Xinjiang? Are you gonna stay in, in Hubei? And, and he said, oh, I don't know. We haven't really discussed that yet. <laughs> and so I said, hmm, okay. It's a lot of things to discuss. Oh, also it was interesting because their house um, had not been renovated, but the room that they were to stay in, because he's the son, so the family will always have a room for the oldest son to stay in, had been renovated with all their wedding furniture and dowry, um, but then they were immediately going to go either to Xinjiang or to the village, a city where she was working. Um, so it just kind of amazed me that there are all these, all these beautifully renovated rooms standing empty all across rural China, waiting for the sons to come back, and maybe they, they'll never come back. But that's what the parents traditionally do, so that's what they do. Um, this is the beginning of the wedding procession, bringing the dowry to the, to the groom's village. Um, he's wearing kind of a comical getup of a dunce cap and a chamber pot, you know, strung around his neck. And, you know, it's really interesting because this was the way that they paraded people through the streets during the Cultural Revolution when there were class enemies, you know, people who were counter-revolutionary. They would wear this kind of comical outfit. And I asked a whole bunch of sociologists whether the Cultural Revolution getup came from folk traditions in rural China or whether rural Chinese were taking these Cultural Revolution ideas and making them into jokes, and no one could give me a good answer. But I thought it was interesting, kind of the interplay between you know, one very comic thing and one very tragic thing at the same time. Um, I'll, I'll zip through this a little bit, so we have questions. Yeah, um, so this is them preparing the dowry for the procession. It was very interesting because you'll see most of the young men are just hanging around smoking cigarettes and talking and there's one older man who's tying the, the dowry onto traditional bamboo poles and I asked them about this and they said, the young men said, you know, we've never done this. We don't know how to carry things on bamboo poles because we spent all our time working in the city. So only the older men kind of know how these traditional things happen. But when the time came, they hoisted the things on their shoulders and walked to the next village. And this is Min and her older sister escorting the young woman back to her, to her new village, to her new husband's village. Um, and you'll notice that she doesn't look very happy about this whole proceeding. And I, you know, there were all these very funny traditions, not funny, all these interesting traditions. Like before, there was a tradition where she had to sit in the room and with her mothers and her aunts all around and cry. And this was because in traditional China, you would be married off to someone you'd never met and you were leaving your home forever. So they still had this tradition that she had to look very sad even though she had met this guy and they had agreed to get married and this was her choice and they were probably gonna live in a big city and in an apartment and go to KFC and all these normal urban things and yet they still kind of reverted to this very traditional kind of behavior which I found very interesting. And these are just uh, wedding greetings. Um, and this is Min when I saw her in March. This is her younger daughter. Um, this is in her husband's family village in Hunan province. And this is Chunming in Dongguan um, when I saw her in March. So 
looking very optimistic and happy as usual. Okay, so I thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. I actually have two questions. The first question is, how did you go about gaining access to the, the factory? And then the other question is, are the two girls curious about what you've been writing in the book? And they, do they ask you to translate? Or what do they say or think about the book? Yeah, thank you. Um, in terms of gaining access, it wasn't that easy. I. I knew I wanted to write a chapter about what life inside a factory was like, and so I, I got the names of six or seven factories, and I, I was told that bigger factories would be more likely to let me in because they were more confident about outsiders, they were more better run usually because they had more, more resources. Um, so I, I approached six or seven big factories, and Yu Yuan, the shoe factory, was the only one who agreed to let me in. Um, and it took a lot of back and forth convincing them that I'm not going to write this horrible expose about you. I, w I really want to learn how the young girls live and really how the factory works is not a big part of it. Um, and, and you know, when I got to know the girls, sometimes I would go with them to their factory, but I would always stand outside because I didn't want to go in and get, get them in trouble because if their boss found out that they'd brought in a foreigner, you know, they would probably get in a lot of trouble. Um, in terms of how the girls see the book, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, with Min, I have a little bit more experience because I wrote two articles about her in the Wall Street Journal when I was still working there, and I actually had the articles translated in Chinese, and I, and I brought them to her when, when they were ready, and, um, and um, we were talking about this earlier, I, was, uh, I sat down in a cafe with her and I gave her the article to read, and I was just, I mean, there's nothing more nerve-wracking than watching someone read something you've written, especially if you've written about her. Um, and I was just sitting there, she turned the pages and turned the pages, and then, and then she was finished, and she said, that's it? And I said, well, I'm waiting to see what happens next. And she gave me this funny look, like she didn't quite connect it with her own story, and then she said, now I remember everything that happened to me. You know, and it was kind of amazing. It was almost like so much had happened to her that she, it was almost like it happened to another person or in another life, you know, and, and that, you know, this was the moment where it all came back to her again. So it wasn't really the response I was expecting. I thought she would be saying, oh, you got this right except for this, or you got this fact wrong, or I wish you'd take that boyfriend out because now I have another boyfriend. But she didn't say anything like that. You know, it was just kind of this memory of things that had happened to her. Um, so, you know, they're very curious about the book, and I've told them that it, it came out in English, and now it's actually being translated for the Chinese market, so I'm really excited um, to see what they think about it. Hi, in, the, uh, in the United States, we tend to think of sort of like centralized planning and communism, like Russia and the so-called experiment, just an utter failure, and people's lives, you know, were just destroyed, and mm -hmm. people are very unhappy. But it, it seems, I, I think you're painting the sort of the under, underbelly of what's going on in China, but it seems like large extent there's a lot of success over there as well and I was wondering if you could say maybe compare it to what happened in the Soviet Union why things are going better in China at least now than you know they're going in um, the Soviet Union mm hmm yeah that's a really huge question for political scientists um, <laughs> yeah I mean I think kind of the you know the standard story and, and a lot of Chinese um, scholars will tell you this as well is that Russia opened up its political system first rather than its economic system, or both at the same time. And this caused huge problems because once they opened up the political system, they lost control of how to guide the economic development. While China has been sort of the other way, it opened up only its economic system, but it's kept a tight control on its political system. And therefore, they're able to do many things like build really good infrastructure, highways, buildings, and all these things, and then kind of set the people free to do economically what they will. Um, I don't know. I mean, that's that's way too simplistic, and it's also a kind of um, rationalizing argument for the Communist Party to cont continue controlling the political system. Um, I think it's I think it's a lot of things. I think one thing is that, um, you know, I, I think that the 
the entrepreneurial traditions of China, which have always been there kind of under the surface. Um, when the Deng Xiaoping economic reform started, it was just a very good way of kind of freeing up people's individual uh, motivations to go out and make their own lives better, to incentivize them to work harder and save money and, and do their own thing. So, you know, I think that the, the Chinese system, for all its problems, for all its corruption, for all the dark underbelly, the things that you're talking about, I think it's, it's in many ways a very functional system. And that's not to say that it isn't very corrupt and it's not unjust, all those things are true, but it's a place where people who work hard can you know, get some benefit from it and people know that and they have more faith. And so that's part of the reason why lives have improved so much. Do you think there's a lot of pressure to change the system or do you think people are kind of happy that the way it is and there's people don't want it to change because a lot of people are doing well there, and there's upward mobility and something to look yeah, forward to. Yeah, I, you know, I don't think there's a lot of pressure for political change right now, um, which, you know, I think that most people, if you ask them point blank, do you like the Communist Party, do you like your local officials, they're not gonna, they're gonna say no, or they're gonna say, oh, I know, you know, they're, they're gonna tell you about corruption stories, and, you know, they're not perfectly satisfied with their leaders by a long shot. But most people are not asking those questions. They're just thinking, well, I wanna do this, I wanna start another company, I wanna buy an apartment, I wanna buy a car, I wanna get my driver's license, I wanna get my kid in a good school, I wanna go on vacation in Thailand. You know, those are the things that they're thinking about right now, and those are things that are possible that weren't possible 10 years ago or 15 years ago. So that's really what people are focusing on now. Um, I think at some point, the urge for political change may happen, but right now is not where people are at. Right now, they're just thinking about their own futures and their own livelihoods. And considering where people are coming from, that's perfectly reasonable, um, I think, that they've, they've come from this place where, you know, even if, if anyone you meet under the age of um, 30 has, has known what it's like to be poor, to not get to eat good food, to have deprivation in one way or another, and now they have something different and they're just trying to enjoy it as much as they can. Thanks. Thank you. I don't want to burst your bubble, but um, are you familiar with Kai Factory, the Microsoft um, factory where they make mice? They, um, and there's kind of, if you go online, you can see pictures of the people, the young girls working seven days and seven nights um, a week and they're kind of sleeping and um, and also about the suicide at Foxconn who are making parts for all our computers just um, if you address it or you're not um, I'm sure you're aware but mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. it's still it's ever present yeah certainly I mean I do mention that a little bit when I write about the Yuyan factory was um, they had had a a bunch of suicides um, in the years before I visited there. Um, young women jumping off tops of buildings and they had done some kind of investigation into it and, and I think they thought there were different reasons. Some were mental illness, some were you know, relationship stresses and, and just the incredible pressure of living and working in a place like that. Um, my general feeling is that you know, these terrible things do happen but it's a mistake to automatically connect it to the horrible conditions in the factories. Um, and, you know, looking into the cases at Yuyan or other places, um, in many cases, it's just the incredible stress of being a young person away from everything you know in a factory setting with a lot of competition with other workers, competitions over boyfriends or dating someone who's married and, you know, love triangles. There are a lot of emotional, very emotionally complicated things, and, and these were most likely the reasons behind most of the, a lot of the suicides. And, you know, for example, if you hear about one of your colleagues or friends who's committed suicide, is your first reaction, oh my God, their work conditions were so horrible. Not necessarily, I mean, you might think they had a really tough life or they were having real problems or, or struggles or maybe they had some of their own health issues. Um, and I think we do these workers a disservice by not seeing their individual stories and immediately jumping to the conclusion that this is about working conditions because that's what we see as an outsider. But you know, I've never been to the Foxconn factory, but I know that it's actually considered on par with a factory like Yuyan, which is that it's a pretty good place to work. Um, good benefits, very stable salary. I see you being very dissatisfied, and it doesn't mean that I'm, I'm sitting here and, you know, supporting these capitalist exploiters. It's just that the story is more complicated than immediately connecting the suicides to the worker conditions. Well, 
Well, you know, I mean, a lot of companies do a lot of dumb things all over the world. You know, that doesn't, that doesn't automatically mean, therefore, these people are committing suicide because Foxconn's such an evil corporation. I mean, I, I just think it's, it's just as condescending to be that way as, as to go on the other end and say these workers have no rights. You know, I think it's just as condescending to see them as facelessly exploited by a huge machine as to say they're stupid and they have no rights. You know, I, I think that the most important thing is try to understand their individual stories. Hi. Um, Hi. <laughs> how, if at all, did writing this book help you understand what it means to be Asian American and the child of immigrants? I'm sorry, say that again? How, if at all, um, did writing this book help you understand what it means to be Asian American and the child of immigrants? Because I'm Korean American. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was actually the hardest part of the book for me was sort of coming to terms with my, what my relationship to China was. Um, and I didn't really want to deal with it and I didn't want to talk about it and I definitely didn't want to write about it. Um, so I don't know, I, I think what I came away from, from this whole project thinking was that in many ways I'm more Chinese than I think I was and that there are many things about the way the Chinese respond to things that I understand. Um, and one, one major thread through the book is how, you know, many of the people I knew and the people in my family were unwilling to talk about their own stories and their own emotions. Um, and, you know, when people would ask me about the book, I would talk about the factory girls and then I'd say it's also about my family history. And then, you know, my, my husband now, I mean, he, he sounds like he's always haranguing me. He actually isn't. But he would say, you know, why don't you tell them about how your grandfather was assassinated during the war? This is like a really dramatic story. And I'd be like, well, I don't want to burden people with this right away. Maybe they're not in the mood to hear about it or, you know, and, and he was like, that's just exactly what you have to write about is just why people are never talking about their own stories. And, you know, so I think in the process of writing it, I, I came to understand that there are many things about my own family that, that have shaped me, you know. Um, but at the same time, I, I think it's, it's easy to overstate that. And I knew many people who would come to China, Chinese Americans, who would immediately feel like they're at home or they never felt at home in America, but here in China they're at home. And I think that's, that's false too, because you know, whatever kind of American you are, you are an American in some way, and you just have to kind of come to terms with what part of that is Chinese and what part is American. Um, so it's still not a very good answer, but uh, that's sort of where I am right now. Um, uh, how, sorry. Great. Um, how would you describe the relationship between the account of your family history and the story of the factory girls, such as Chunming and Ming? Like, what is, uh, how do these stories connect to each other? Thank you. Um, I guess I would say that, you know, our view, our kind of stereotypical view of China is that, you know, until the modern era, it was unchanging and people just stayed in their homes and never went anywhere except the super elite who are able to go out and go to school and become officials. Um, and when you look back through Chinese history, it's actually, there have been so many phases of migration, um, people leaving home, and that, you know, one of the things I found in my research was that the, the genealogy of a family would always begin with the first migrant, with the person who came to this new place and established the line of their family. Um, so it's really a story of, of journeys and opportunities and people trying to make their way and, and, and do something better. So that was the link that made me want to write about my own family story and tie them to this modern generation. Um, I also felt like you can't really understand the drive and the the drive and the energy and the forward lookingness that people in China have now without, without understanding where they're coming from. And I think a lot of reason that people are only looking forward now is because they're afraid to look backward because there are a lot of things in recent Chinese history that are very painful. Um, and they're not just things that involve leaders, they're things that involved students attacking their teachers and people in villages criticizing other villagers and driving them to suicide. and and very violent, horrible things that happened in society among ordinary people that people don't want to face. Um, and so right now, it's the time to look forward and improve our lives and, and focus on good things. Um, so I wanted to have that sense in the book in some way, and I wasn't going to find it in Dongguan because you can't, if people don't talk about it, I didn't want to force them to talk about something that is not on their, on their radar. So the way to do it was to kind of look back in history in my own family story. Yeah. Thank you for uh, visiting with us today. I was just wondering, what are you thinking of for your next writing venture? 
Um, yeah, I'm actually moving to Cairo next week. Um, yeah, so uh, I spent the summer, my husband and I spent the summer studying intensive Arabic at Middlebury College, um, which was probably the hardest and possibly the worst experience of my life. <laughs> Um, partly because we have twin one-year-olds and we had to study Arabic six hours a day and do four hours of homework and also take care of twin girls. Um, so we're moving there and we'd hope to spend more time studying the language and then writing about the place in, in magazine articles and books. Um, in some way I feel like the Middle East is obviously very, very different in its own, you know, part of the world. but. Um, it's similar to the place China occupied maybe 10 or 15 years ago in the national consciousness in that people tend to focus on the political stories. You know, you read about the, the Arab Spring, but before that you would read about terrorism and young men and jihadis, and you wouldn't really, really necessarily read about what ordinary lives are like or, you know, what, I'm curious what, what women's lives are like, what kind of power do they really have in families. Um, how are people, how do people connect religion and modernity? You know, all, the, all these kind of normal things that people are going through. So that, those are the kind of things that, you know, I hope to learn about and write about. Um, so I think the next book might take, you know, four or five years, just like this one did. Um, so it'll take a while till I figure out what's going on there and what to write about. Um, there's a one line where you say, well, she's really like an American. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I read the ending of this book many times because I couldn't figure out what the affect was. What I mean is that I felt that there was a level of disappointment that she didn't turn out <laughs> the way you wanted. So because you were a novelist now and she was going to be the beautiful ending of your book because she was going to give all of this up and learn English and really become something. Oh, you saw right through me. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, that was one of the lessons I was going to write about, but then I decided not to talk about it because it got too uh, too complicated. But yeah, I mean, when when towards the end of the book, when she was about to ditch it all and learn English, I was like, this is great. She's going to like embrace the world, and it's going to be a perfect ending to my story. And instead, she gave that up and started another pyramid scheme to do health supplements. Um, and you know, and. The lesson, of course, is always, you know, you can't make this stuff up, you know, and you just have to follow where people go, and this maybe makes more sense in her life because there's more of an instant payoff and, and, and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I definitely did feel I connected with her a lot, and I felt she connected with me a lot. And, um, you know, as I mentioned in the book, when, um, when I got married or got engaged kind of towards the end of the time I was in China, she said to me, oh, your mother must be very happy. I think she's a very traditional person. <laughs> I was just like, how does she know? It's <laughs> totally true. Um, and recently I was talking to her on the phone and she said, I'm now the age you are when you first met me and I'm still unmarried. You know, and I tried to deny that and say, no, it's not true, but it, it's true. You know? um, so yeah, I, do, I definitely do connect with her and I feel like her her struggle to find meaning in life and to find a meaning that's not simply about marrying well and finding a good husband who will support you, but to find someone that you really love, but also to have a life outside of that. I mean, it's really hard and, you know, I admire her for it and I feel like that's what I, I was trying to do too. So I definitely connected with her. Um, in terms of writing, yeah, it was definitely very hard to transition from a journalist. I mean, you call me a novelist, but that's too kind, from a journalist to a nonfiction writer. Um, and I didn't really realize how hard it was because when I, when I first went into journalism, I actually wanted to be a writer, but I needed to get a job um, because I'm Chinese American and I'm very pragmatic. So I got a job at the Wall Street Journal and, and there I was and I learned a lot. And then when I started to write this book, I realized that there are a lot of things that I don't know about how to write. And there are a lot of things you learn in journalism that are very useful in terms of how to write clearly, how to make an argument. Um, 
how to be very logical, but there are also a lot of things you don't learn, how to really describe a person, how to write about yourself, you know, how to be funny, um, a lot of things that the newspaper, quite rigid uh, conventions of newspaper writing don't really allow. Um, so there are a lot of things that I, I really had to learn and force myself to learn along the way. Um, I actually read a lot of fiction while I was writing this book um, because I think that you want to get these rhythms of really, really beautiful language um, into your head. You know, I studied some really, really good nonfiction writers, John McPhee, um, Susan Orleon, just reading their things, seeing, you know, really trying to study it technically. How do they get into a scene? How do they get out of a scene? What do they leave out? What do they put in? And it's very different from how time really passes in life. For example, you could have a scene that takes two minutes that you spend two pages describing. And then you could have something that happens over eight hours or that happens over months that you put into one really tight paragraph. And so it's really interesting to read these writers and see, oh my gosh, he got that, but it took him so long to get that one thing. But it works much better all mushed together like this rather than all lengthened like that, you know? And so, I mean, it's kind of endless, the education that you, that you can have. That's, that's great news for you guys, that your education is endless. Um, but so many things you can learn from, from the really good writers. Um, but it's, it's definitely taken me a long time and I feel like I still have a lot to learn. Yes, hi. hi. Um, I read your book, because um, I'm a professor here and, and so um, serving as a, a freshman advisor, so I figured out over the summer I better read the book so that <laughs> when students write to me, I have some idea. So I enjoyed reading your book um, profoundly. One question I have now is, um, you must have thought about it. Um, how, I know you, you know, acting as a totally sort of a, a, you know, objective outside observer and try not to perturb the life, not to apply any judgment. So you know, that's a great attitude. But it must be in some subtle ways that you have affected the lives of, you know, men and the trained men, you know, with whom you have sort of, you know, built a relationship. You know, they actually view you as, you know, somebody they can trust. Mm -hmm. They can sort of, you know, engage and stay engaged in the intellectual dialogue over years. Um, and that's great, but that must have some really positive impact on their life. And what have you thought about that? What do you speculate that might mm -hmm. be? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, as you say, I tried to be as um, unintrusive, unobtrusive, inobtrusive in their lives as possible. Um, when they talked to me about plans they had or, or decisions to enter new pyramid schemes, um, I would listen, but you know, not try not to pass judgment. I, I think, you know, my role on their life was, it was very different from what I expected. I thought that they would ask me for help. I thought they would ask me for favors um, just because I was so much more privileged and had so many more things than they did, but they never did that. Um, I feel like my role in their life was kind of as a, as a, a listener, a sympathetic friend, and someone who stayed the same while everything around them was changing. And, you know, I hope that was a positive, influence in their life in that they could feel like they could count on me and that I would not disappear. I mean, physically I'm gone, but I'm, I call them constantly, you know, I call them regularly by phone and they know how to get in touch with me if they need to or if, if they want to talk about anything or if they need help. Um, so, but I didn't feel like I affected their lives as much as you might expect or as much as maybe I expected. Um, you know, for example, when Min would make a transition from one job to another, it would be, I think, it would just be because she felt like this was a better job, and it was probably helpful for her to talk it through with me and, and hear what I had to, you know, my response, but I would never say to her, oh, you should do that or you shouldn't do that. I mean, all I would say is, oh, it sounds like you want to do this, maybe that's what you should do, you know. Um, but, you know, I, I think there is definitely um, a relationship that develops when you, when you spend so much time with someone. Um, you know, I, I probably know her better than most people in the world, you know, other than her, probably better than her parents, you know, other than her husband, and maybe I know her better than anyone else, you know, um, because I've spent so much time talking with her and asking her questions. Um, so you do have to be careful not to intrude too much and pass judgment, but, you know, in general, I feel like they're very resourceful, independent people, and, um, you know, hopefully our relationship for all its inequalities in terms of our backgrounds was kind of a balanced friendship. Um, 
I would imagine that like with a lot of young people, many of whom are in uh, not the greatest economic standing going into a city, you'd see an increase in like crime, be it drug trafficking, gang violence, or theft. Did you notice a lot of that in the Chinese cities you were in? Yeah, um, you know, China's not a very violent society, and there are very few guns. Um, I don't know if I've ever seen a gun in China. Um, so there, there's a lot of petty crime, um, especially, you know, when there was an economic downturn in Dongguan, there was a lot of um, people anecdotally told me about a rise in petty crime, people riding by motorcycles, purse snatching, or, um, you know, kind of threatening someone at an ATM machine and getting, getting them to give them cash out of their out of their account. Um, so lots of petty crimes like that, but not large-scale violent crimes. There, there isn't a big gang problem. Um, there is drug trafficking in certain parts of the country, um, especially in the Southwest, um, bordering Burma and near Vietnam, but not in the places where I was. Um, so there is a lot of petty crime, but there isn't that kind of large-scale urban violence that you might see in many other developing world cities. <laughs> um, what should I say? I mean, I, I feel like um, it, I feel really lucky that I was able to see China during this era where, when I lived there, because I, I feel like China isn't going to be that way forever. And, and people say to me, "God, it just sounds crazy. It's changing every second, and and there's so much going on, and, and there's so much energy, and it's amazing. But it's also very, very hard on people who live there. You know, the stress and the pressure to to keep up. And it, it makes me think that this was a really unusual moment when when old was becoming new, and this moment will pass, and things will become more normal and more stable. And that's a great thing for people who live there. Um, but as a writer, you know, we don't like normal and stable things. We like immense change and disruption. Um, so I, I, I lived there from 1998 to 2007, and I feel like it was really an amazing time to, to be there. And when people look back on that time the way we look back on the 19th century, and it's really not the election of 1876 that we care about, it's really about the industrialization and the, and the immigration that changed America. And I feel like they'll look back on this era and realize it wasn't the speech that Hu Jintao gave on this day, it's actually this incredible urbanization and migration that changed China. So I'm just happy that I was able to be there. And I'm happy you read my book, thank you.